Hey everyone, uh, Todd Schutte with the Bona eLearning team. And I'm Dee Liston with the tech and training team. Uh, we want to welcome you guys today to the next edition of our Bona training webinar series. Today we're going to talk about Bona Dry Fast Stain. Um, we've had actually a quick drying stain product for over 30 years. And Dry Fast Stain is that second iteration that we've had for over 20 years now. A lot of great features and benefits with this product that can really help you guys out with a lot of the common issues that you have out there maybe in your staining processes. And one of the more common calls we tend to get on the tech line are typically stain related. Either guys are just really trying to get back on a stain too soon or you know just pushing an envelope in some way or fashion. One of the features I really love about our dry fast stain is the self dissolving features. It really allows you to be able to back your way out of a room and not have the lap lines. I also really appreciate the low odor mineral spirits that's used in our formulation that doesn't tend to smell as bad as most stains out there. We also have the flexibility of adding Court Lines paint, which is our sport paint, into the stains to give you a variety of different color options as well. Yeah, one of the other great features about it is because it's made with oil modified resin technology, it actually dries and cures. So the biggest thing that guys have a problem with stain or the biggest problem it causes for you is when too much stain gets down in the seams and soft grain and doesn't dry before you put on your sealer and finish. But because we're the only company that makes a product like this that's made with oil modified resin technology that dries and cures, any stain that gets down in those areas has a much better chance to actually dry and cure before you put your sealer or finish over the top so it doesn't cause problems later on. So what we're gonna go over with you guys today is some best practices on custom color blends, on dry times, on stain rag safety. Then we're gonna jump into some demonstration videos uh, that we did here on uh, application. So applying with a cut in pad and ragging off and then buffing on and buffing off which is uh, probably the most popular option out there right now. But there's a lot of ways to be successful with this product. So let's go ahead and jump into best practices. Now I'm gonna go over color blends. Anytime you're making a color blend, it's best to work from our base colors. Also, when you're making a blend, it's best to use weight and not volume. You also have an option of using our Court Lines paint and blending that in with our stains, but anytime you do that, you have to make sure you allow for a 24 hour dry time, and it also has to be abraded. You wanna make sure you're keeping a great record of any ratios that you're mixing also. So document your ratios, and uh, keep that on file in case you ever have to go back to do a repair or you're trying to add on to an existing a floor that you've did in the past. Save your leftovers, that's gonna be important as well. So anytime you have, uh, you know, for doing repairs or adding on to an existing floor, having that leftover would be key along with having great records of uh, the blend that you created. And the last thing I like to cover is being created when naming that stain blend you just made. Some contractors will name that stain blend after the homeowner's uh, house that they're working on. Some will name it after a design they may have put on the floor, but have fun with it and be creative. Now back to Todd, he's gonna cover stain rag safety. All right, thanks, D. Hey, serious subject here for a second, guys. Uh, stain rag safety. Uh, dry fast stain is a solvent-based product, so the risk of spontaneous combustion is real, right? Let's practice the face you make whenever you see on social media or you get a text from uh, one of your buddies, right, who has pictures of his stain rag fire. It goes something like this, right? It's not a good face to make. So we just got a notice the other day from, again, one of the BCCPs uh, who lost his whole truck. It was a single stain rag that, I don't know if it was he or one of his helpers tossed in the back of the truck, but just a little over two weeks ago, they sent the pictures in. Uh, the whole truck was a total loss. So it's a real danger out there every day. So make sure that you teach all your guys, have plenty of warning placards up, whether it's in your vans, uh, a best practice uh, safety checklist that you guys often run through at the job sites, just to make sure that you take care of that issue. So we already have a good video on stain rag safety from our existing stain videos. So let's go ahead and take a look at one of those clips on stain rag safety. Individually lay out the stain-soaked carpet circles, cleaning bonnets, wiping rags, 
and any other contaminated materials to dry, or place in a water-filled container to prevent spontaneous combustion and lay out to dry individually back at your shop. Once dry, dispose of these used materials in accordance with local laws and regulations. I hope you found that stain rag safety video informative. Uh, it's important that you guys stay safe out there. If you don't have any processes in place to reduce this risk, then I hope you're able to get something from that video and that you can put your own processes in place. Now we're going to go to our demonstration video where we're going to cover stain application. We have a cut-in pad application with a rag off as well as a buff on, buff off uh, demonstration. Then we'll be back for a live Q&A session. All right, so when staying in the house, you definitely want to have a game plan in mind. And in this particular layout, what we're going to do is we're going to use a method called cut in pad on and then wipe off. So similar to rag on, rag off, um, the reason why some guys would use a cut in pad is just really for to be able to press more stain out of the pad as, a, as opposed to hold more stain in the rag. So... Uh, and there's the BCCs, they'll do a different way, like some guys will start in or do an area where they're going to work out at, that way that area has a chance to dry by the time they get there in order to prevent having to do sections at a time back in their way out of the room. What we're going to do today is we're going to use a cutting pad, we're going to rag off, and we're going to start up against this wall. Here we have a closet. And what we're going to do is we're going to cut in up to the edge of the uh, two by four or wall. And then we'll go down this whole wall. As I'm cutting in, uh, we're going to have uh, my coworker Bobby's going to be ragging off behind me. So we'll do sections at a time, just sections wide enough to where we're able to reach. And because the stain has the self dissolving feature to where it'll blend back into itself, we really don't have to worry about lap lines, but you do want to stay you know, parallel with the wood as much as possible to prevent any hard cut marks going across the wood. In regards to taping off baseboards, that's all going to depend on whether or not you're putting cord around around the baseboards, but most guys will tape off the baseboards to prevent stain from getting up on the baseboards. So what we're going to do here, we'll kind of show you going all the way up against the baseboards with the tape. And then along our butt ends, what we're going to do is a technique where we're, we're going to leave a little bit of stain close to the baseboards, and then the guy that's ragging off will actually make sure he pushes his rag all the way up to the baseboard, preventing getting stain onto the baseboard. But again, if you have quarter round, then it's not an issue because the quarter round will cover anywhere you get onto the baseboard. With this particular method that we're getting ready to do, we're going to use the cut-in rag-off method with this color stain. There's four color stains that are more heavily pigmented and may take a lot longer to dry, being spice brown, cocoa, ebony, and bark. This particular color is bark, so what we're going to do is cut in, rag off, and the reason why we're using this method as opposed to buffing stain on, which you can do with all of our colors, you may notice that the four colors that I mentioned may tend to feel a little thicker as you're buffing those on, so it's not that you cannot buff on with those colors, but you may notice that they may tend to be a little bit thicker as you're heating it up when you're buffing that on. So what I'm getting ready to do now is pour the stain into our paint tray. And on the bottom of our paint tray, we do have felt tips on there. That way we minimize uh, scratching the floor as we pour, as we pull our paint tray across the floor. Alrighty, so I'll dip the paint pad into the tray. And I'll cut in this closet area just to get it nice and saturated. And then Bobby will come in after I move down the wall and he'll take this off as I continue to work down the floor. Up against the baseboard, since we don't have tape, what Bobby will do is he will, as he's ragging off, he will take the rag and put more stain right along the baseboard. So I'll continue to move down the room. And since we have tape, I can put the cutting pad right up against the tape line, making sure that I'm just spreading the stain 
as much as I can, using a feathering technique at the end to prevent any hard stop marks. Although our stain will re-dissolve itself once you go over it, I'm not too concerned about those stop marks, but just in keeping in good habit of feathering, as we discussed with our finished products, we'll do the stain, we'll do the same with our stain. As we work around the closet, and Bobby will step in to start to rag that off, we'll probably work a bigger section as long as his arms can reach, so that way we can get more done as we get out into the open room. Again, this technique, it just kind of minimizes how much stain you're putting onto the floor, and it also keeps your job site a little cleaner versus the rag on, rag off when you're dipping the rags into the bucket. So as I continue to put more stain down, as I mentioned earlier, since we don't have tape along the baseboards here, I'm getting close enough to where when Bobby rags off, he'll be able to uh, push his rag close enough to the baseboard to where he'll get covers there. So as Bobby continues to rag off, once he gets about halfway down the room, I'll start the next section and we'll continue to move in about three to four foot sections. And as we get out, working our way out of the room, we'll kind of demonstrate the way you back yourself out of the room and allow to overlap. Again, this is just another technique that you can use, um, you know, versus rag on, rag off. Some guys may brush their stain on, which it's kind of hard to control the amount of stain you're putting down when you're using a brush. Um, but just a, another method, as you can see, kind of applied the same way as ragging on, ragging off. Now that Bobby's halfway down the room, what I'll do is I'll start the next section. What you might want to be careful of if you're water popping the floor and using this technique would be dragging your soles across the floor, your, the heels of your shoes or toes, making sure that you're not um, closing up your grain. And in order to get good coverage, what I'm trying to do is squeeze out as much stain as I can onto the floor, and then I'll just kind of feather and smooth everything out. All right, so now that Bobby has ragged off our first section and I started applying stain in the second section, I'll just continue on applying. And you know, again, after letting the stain sit for a minute or two, Bobby will jump back in and now he'll continue to rag off. So we'll continue this step all the way until we get to our last run. And at that point, we'll discuss how to back our way out of the room. All right, so now that we're down to our last run, there's a few things I want to remind you guys of. One, depending on the type of stain you're using, especially like a gray or a white, where sometimes those color pigments can tend to separate the longer they sit, it's important, even working out of a tray, that you kind of keep mixing your stain up as you go along as well as out of your pour bucket. The longer that sits, you want to mix that pour bucket up periodically before pour, pouring back into your paint tray. That way you keep those color pigments stirred up well. Um, not so crucial with this particular color, but you know, white is one of the colors and gray is one of the colors where you tend to get some separation of color pigments. So blending that in, and I've learned that the hard way myself, uh, working out of a paint tray to where now you start to see each section you did because you're losing some of that color pigment. So be careful of that. Now what we're getting ready to do is I'll start up against this wall and I'll work a section just big enough for Bobby to be able to rag it off and then we'll step back in and I'll do another section making sure I'm overlapping. Again with one of the features of our stains that it kind of re-dissolves itself. We don't have to worry about the lap lines as we do one section after another as opposed to some other stains out there. If your doorway happens to be in the middle of this run, then one technique you can use is after 
applying stain in one section of the room, or I should say at that wall, while he's ragging off, I would come back down to this wall and start applying stain, and we'll keep moving back and forth. That's if your doorway is in the middle. So again, you know, have a plan based on where your lay, the way your layout is, and then that way you can determine how you should blend everything back into the middle. Now that Bobby has ragged off the section, now I'll step back in and just apply more stain and we'll keep working our way out of the room that way. We'll apply a section, rag it off, and then apply a section, rag it off. And again, with the self-dissolving stain, you don't have to worry about any hard marks going perpendicular across the, the wood grain. All right, so now that we're working our way out of this room, it's not important to put blue tape right onto the board seam. As long as you try to stop on the seam as much as you can, even if you come over a little bit, again, once we start to work down this hallway, the stain will redissolve itself and work back into itself. If you did leave a little bit of a hard line or you thought there was a line there, it'll look more like the grain patterns changing versus you know, having to put, it's not a bad idea, you can put tape there, but now you gotta worry about peeling the tape off when you're ready to work back into that section. So here, we'll just kinda reach into the doorway. We'll apply our stain in this last section. Come down the wall. Blend back in, and, and as you notice, this area set a little bit longer as we worked our way down the, uh, the run. But as you'll see, it'll blend right into itself. Maybe I'll just rub a little bit harder just to kind of help blend that in. But as he wipes it off, you'll notice that there will not be any kind of a hard line there. So now that I'm getting close to the doorway, what I want to do is just make sure I just kind of come right up to the uh, board seam just to apply a little stain. And as Bobby rags off, he'll probably come over the seam, but again, it's light enough and it'll blend back in to where you don't have to worry about putting tape there. All right, so now that we're finished doing the bedroom there, what we're gonna do is we're gonna move over to this wall and work our way back to the hallway and we'll do the hallway last, reason being is because we have a doorway exit there, and if we did the hallway now, we'd be blocking ourselves into the room, although you probably could, you know, put some rags up under your feet and wiggle your way out of there, but, you know, the best case scenario and the best practice would be to blend everything in, come down to the hallway, and then we'll work our way down the hallway and out of the room, creating the stop area here just as we did in the doorway, and then it'll blend in as we work our way out of the room. All righty, now that we finished the bedroom and we finished our other little living room area, similar to how we backed our way out of the bedroom, doing a sections at a time, we're gonna do the same thing down the hallway and we'll join up with the doorway in the bedroom and the uh, hallway going from the living room area, we'll just kind of work our way out and everything will blend in just as we did in the bedroom. All right, now that we've completed our stain application here, the cut-in pad to apply it and ragging off is one method. It's not the only method you can use. Rag on, rag off is also would work. Um, buffing on the stain and buffing off the stain, which you'll see shortly, could also work in a smaller area like this. Um, so this is just one technique that we just decided to show you guys. And because of the type of pigment we were working with with this particular color of stain. So um, again, have a game plan. Uh, decide whether or not you're going to tape off your baseboards and, and cut off sections and then blend everything in. So having that game plan is very important. So now we're going to do buff on, buff off on this side of the floor. Uh, it's probably the most popular method that's out there right now. A lot of guys still rag on, rag off, or as, as Dee and Bobby just demonstrated. 
um, taking a cut-in pad to apply and then ragging off. Uh, but especially because dry fast stain is so self-dissolvable, makes it the ideal candidate out there to buff on and buff off. It's actually an old school type uh, method that a student showed us at one of the schools. Dry fast stain's been out about 20 years, which blows my mind a little bit. But uh, you know, at first when we came out with it, we were just doing rag on, rag off, just like everything else. Then one day at one of our schools, some guy said, you guys should really take that stuff and, and buff it on and buff it off because that's what I've been doing and it's fantastic. And it dawned on us that again, because it's so self-dissolvable, yeah, it would be probably the best stain out there that you could do that with. Um, some of the benefits, one, I'm upright. Um, I don't have to get down on my hands and knees except for the, the cutting in, um, still have to do that. Uh, I'm upright. Maybe the biggest benefit of all is it doubles your application rate. So instead of 800 to 1,000 square feet per gallon, I'm gonna get somewhere between 1,600 and 2,000 square feet per gallon. Uh, the floor is gonna be just the same. The, the difference is I don't have so much waste. Uh, when you rag on, rag off, or cut in pad and rag off, you've still got a lot up on top of the surface no matter how much you're trying to kind of squeeze that out on top. But the buffer just leaves so little on top of the surface that it really spreads out my application rate. Now, for the purists out there, uh, yeah, because of that, it does put it on just a smidge lighter than say if I rag on, rag off. Um, obviously, if I've water popped the floor, that doesn't matter. It's still gonna be the, the same darker tone, full tone um, across the whole floor if, if I water popped. It's only gonna be if I do a regular uh, floor preparation. So this side we've uh, actually abraded to 120. Uh, this side we abraded to 120 black and then water popped it back. So you'll see the two different colors. But if I were to rag on, rag off half this section over here because it's only abraded to 120 and then uh, buff on, buff off half of it, rag on, rag off would be a little bit darker, have a little more of that color in it. But that's it. Um, to me, the trade-offs are you know, the, the, it doesn't make uh, a difference what rag on, rag off is going to do. Uh, I want all the benefits of doing the buff on, buff off. So when we do that, first of all, we want to have our buffer clean. All right, I don't want to uh, have just finished up either my 80, 100, 120, whatever my final buffing was, pull my drive plate off from my multi-disc, slap my regular drive plate on here and have all the dust still under here. So we've cleaned this off. Uh, we're going to switch to the regular 16 inch uh, flat drive plate and we're gonna use one maroon pad to go ahead and drive everything. And then we're gonna use uh, carpet pads. Now, you'll notice these are new. These aren't from the carpet that we just pulled out of the house, right? That's uh, 150 years old, um, has all sorts of uh, vermin in it and dust and wax and everything else. Uh, we don't wanna use that. You wanna use new carpet pads, something that's low nap. Um, a twist pile is really good because all we're gonna use is this as a carrier. We usually use one of these to apply, and most times in a house, uh, you're just gonna need one carpet pad throughout the whole thing to apply. If you're using some of the other stains that have uh, a little bit heavier pigment load in them, again, the ebony, spice brown, cocoa, bark, white, um, then you might notice after a while, maybe 500 feet or so, that your application pad really starts kind of getting smeary. You'll notice that when you tip it over uh, when you're going back to clean off the excess that it's just loaded with pigment. If that happens, then go ahead and switch out to a new carpet pad, a uh, piece of carpet. So just to make sure that you've got a new carpet applicator going and it's not totally loaded up. You'll also notice that they'll tend to spit stuff out, really little solids, little loaded pigment chunks out there if that's tending to happen. So if it does, just switch it out, have a new piece of carpet to go with. And so what we'll do is we'll tend to go ahead and apply a path all the way down the floor, and then we'll take our application piece of carpet off, we'll put another clean piece of carpet on, and we'll go back over that path to take off the excess. Some guys will do the whole room uh, and or the whole house, apply everything first, then go back with their excess remover pad and go over everything. But I like to tend to work in sections, kind of get a little done as we go, make sure everything's going okay, and not walk back all over in the stain. 
Um, the other thing is I really like to use a, a carpet cleaning bonnet, which is a big white cotton loop pad. Uh, they were a little bit COVID scarce this week, so I couldn't get any. So we're just using a, an additional piece of carpet, which I believe is what most guys do out there to clean off the excess, so, so not a problem. All right? And then the, the other question is, okay, what about cutting in? Totally personal preference. Um, you can cut in before, you know, like we usually do. You can cut in kind of during, and we'll show you that as well. Or you can cut in afterwards. Again, something that a, a student showed us at one of the schools. I'd never thought of it, but he said, you know, the, putting it on with the buffer gets so close to the wall that if I go ahead and cut in afterwards, I've only got inch, inch and a half to go ahead and cut in. The mistake I see most people make or that gets them into trouble um, when they are applying with the buffer is they're still cutting in six, eight, ten inches wide all the way around the room, and you don't need to. You only need to cut in inch, inch and a half. Um, because if they apply or they cut in way too dark on the sides, you know, again, six, eight, ten inches all the way around, I'm much more likely to see then a picture frame all the way around if they don't do a good job of, of wiping off the excess while they're cutting in. So if I have to have that problem, I'd rather have it just an inch or an inch wide, not six, eight, or ten inches wide, right? That's going to be much less noticeable right next to the wall if I got a little bit of a dark difference right there or deeper difference than that much all the way around the wall. Um, so take care. You don't have to cut in very much when you're using the, uh, the carpet application. And again, you can do it before, you can do it after, and we'll show you how to kind of do it during. All right, let's get going. So now what we're going to do is I'm going to go ahead and uh, put some stain on the carpet pad. We're going to start our first path up this way. And as I get past this point, since we'll only have about a 16-inch wide path, it'll be narrow enough so Bobby can just reach over that as I'm going by and continuing down uh, my path to cut in kind of after me. So he could follow along after me. Again, just kind of like when we're putting on finish or if you were ragging on and ragging off and kind of cutting in as we go, all right? So when we start with the, the stain on the carpet, we're going to pour about a cup, cup and a half out there. I like to spread it out a little bit. Don't just pour everything right in the middle. Flip your carpet over. And then the other thing we've done, make sure you take your brush skirt off, all right? Uh, we've done that. Uh, Definitely have seen other people do it where you accidentally leave that brush skirt on, then you get stain all over it, it uh, gets all stiff, now you need another brush skirt. So we've got the stain on the bottom of our piece of carpet, and now we can start working that down the floor. So like I said, what I'm gonna do here is try to stay far enough away or not have multiple passes, right? Not get it too wide so that Bobby can reach across and cut in right behind me as we go. Also, you'll see little pieces of the carpet kicking off, especially because I'm working against two by fours. Um, it's not a problem. Don't get worried about carpet that ends up shooting out onto the floor. I wouldn't worry about picking it up right now. Uh, you can come back afterwards and just vacuum those off. Uh, it's not going to be an issue. And what I'm doing when I'm applying with the buffer is I'm watching the soft grain. So, especially when I'm next to the wall where he's already cut in, I want to make sure that I'm spending enough time with the buffer so it's filling in that soft grain to the same degree that Bobby did when he was cutting it in. And when I see that fill of that soft grain match up, I know I've got a uh, a good match between where I've applied it and where he went ahead and cut in. So 
So again, that's a way that you could go ahead and cut in while somebody else is running the buffer, especially down that first path. He could obviously then follow me as I'm on the sidewalls to do the same thing. But typically with the buffer, what you want to do, and depends on how, uh, how long your runs are, how big the room is, but I usually like to do about a three foot wide path down the floor uh, with one load, and then we will come back and buff off any excess. Again, what some guys do, they will just keep going until they can really see their pad running thin, and then they'll tip it over, pour on some more, um, keep going, do the whole room, and then come back with another pad to remove any excess. All right, so now I've got my three foot path. My first one worked out here. So now I'm gonna take my buffer, tip it back, take my applicator carpet. I wanna set it fairly close to where I'm gonna be again. Don't set it out here. Again, even though the self, this product is self-dissolvable, once it starts soaking through the back here, I don't want to risk that I leave a big old carpet mark, a heavy mark over here that I don't pay attention to making sure I get it out. So set it fairly close to where you're going to be coming next. Go ahead and set your, either your carpet bonnet or your piece of carpet that you're using to remove any excess down. And then just go ahead and make that path to Continue to blend everything out, remove any excess. This is also a great time to check for, again, heavy marks, misses, uh, differences in, you know, cut-in application. This is also the uh, water pop side of our floor, so we got a lot of color coming out here. You'll also see that it, uh, when you water pop the floor, you don't get as much contrast between the hard and the soft grain because it's opening up that hard grain so that it accepts a lot more of the stain. As you can see over on the, the bark side, we did not water pop it, so you've got that contrast between the hard and the soft grain. And you'll also be, see a big difference here than when we get over to the side that we only uh, abraded with 120 and didn't water pop it, just how we continue then to get that contrast between the hard and the soft grain. Okay, so I made my Removal pass or my feathering pass, if you want to call it that. We can back that off. Same thing with my excess remover, right? Uh, I want to set it down fairly close to where I'm going to be next. I can set my carpet pad up here. Grab my stain. We're going to add a little bit more to it. And then we want to follow the same, you know, kind of best practices that we do when we're either putting it on, you know, ragging on, ragging off. So I am going to overlap a little bit where I was before, because you'll notice like this area right here, it's a little thinner than what I got it right here. So even though I did get stain here, if I come down here and just cut that off, I'm definitely going to have a, a light mark. So be watching for those kinds of areas. Go ahead and overlap a little bit, just kind of even everything out. And again, don't race down that floor. You want to make sure that uh, the carpet is able to deposit enough of the stain in that soft grain. Uh, the hard grain should not be a problem. And some guys have different things they like to do with the buffer. I mean, some guys may like to kind of go back and forth like this as they're buffing it on. Uh, I think there's a lot of different ways to get there. So you can experiment with some of your application methods, but just, again, understand what you're trying to do. I'm trying to get an even application, especially throughout the soft grain. I'm trying to limit, really, the amount of stain I put on, right, because I'm just trying to stain the surface of the floor. I'm not trying to, this isn't going to penetrate a quarter inch or an eighth of an inch. I just need to stain the surface. Uh, anything else I get too far down into seams or soft grain or any more excess I leave on top, is just wasted product because I'm either going to take it off or it's going to go down into the seams and soft grain and dry there or not dry and then cause me a problem. So I really want to limit the amount of stain I put on uh, and not flood this floor. 
You can also see with this method compared to, again, a traditional rag on, rag off, or when they were putting it on with the cut-in pad, how little I have left on the surface uh, after making a pass. Uh, it just puts it on, you know, so much thinner, but I'm still getting that push of product down into the floor and across that surface where I need it. So again, if you see some, some places where you're a little concerned, I think I need a little more there, I want to touch that, want to hit that again, go ahead and do that. You know, you've got the flexibility, it's still plenty wet. And then I can come back after I feel I've got a good path. I can go, go ahead and put my uh, removal pad back on. And just keep it uh, shallow enough so I don't have to reach out here, right? So again, probably three or four feet is about the max you want to go. And you can kind of start getting a feeling too for when we come in and cut in afterwards uh, how little of an area we actually have to cover. Another aspect, I guess, that I really like in regard to buffing on and buffing off is because the machine is doing the work, I really feel that this is an operation that one guy could do. Now again, it always makes it easier, especially with the cutting in and stuff to have two guys, but unless I have a huge house, we could have two guys working two buffers, you know, in different places throughout the house. Uh, however, if I, I can do the whole house myself and do it in uh, probably a lot less time than uh, I could ragging on, ragging off with two people. So now you see that we hit the uh, unwater popped side. And maybe not a huge dramatic difference yet, but it will be when I go back over it with the uh, removal carpet. The other thing I should talk about too, and again, this, this webinar really isn't about water popping, but when you do have a water pop floor, again, you gotta be careful about it. So You'll see as I'm backing up here to my cord, I want to make sure, especially if you don't have a helper who's pulling the cord out of your way, be careful that you don't run over that cord, especially if you're on a water pop floor. Even on a non-water popped, I don't want to do that because it can definitely leave a little strike mark in my floor. But definitely on water popped, uh, one of the best ways to put a mark in that floor is to run over your cord. Also when I'm applying stain on a, uh, just a regular prep floor, it's, uh, I'm gonna get even more coverage. When I'm, you're putting it on a water pot floor, it definitely takes it, uh, takes more stain, but I'm gonna get even more coverage when I'm working on this side of the floor. Again, I don't wanna make so big of a path that I can't reach back across it even though some guys will just go ahead and walk through it. That's all right, I got it. But also don't be afraid to again, take a step out into it. You know, my only concern there is then going to be stepping back onto the homeowner's carpet or tile or anything else that I don't want to get stain on. I'm not concerned if I get some footprints out here because of the self-dissolvability uh, self of the product. Uh, I know those are going to come out when I go back over them. So if you do come to a situation where you do need to step back out into the, the stain that you just put down to hit a mark or get something else, uh, I wouldn't worry about it. Just go out in there and get it. Just be aware though that you've now got stain on the uh, bottom of your shoe. And it's also one of the reasons why whether we're putting down sealer, finish, definitely when I'm putting down stain, I always have, we always have a walk off towel so that I know when I come to that doorway or wherever our designated walk-off area is, I'm not stepping back onto the homeowner's carpet or their tile or any other floor covering that I don't want to get possible little stain footprints in. So 
So all I'm going to want to be kind of cognizant of here, one is, yeah, am I getting any stain on my cord? And or where am I stepping? Because when I take out, come back and take off the excess, make that path, I just want to make sure that I go back over any place where I may have stepped uh, to take those footprints out of the floor. But because of the self-dissolvability of the product, again, I've got a lot of flexibility with how I can use it, where I can go. I'm not that worried about getting it on certain things because I know it cleans off really well. I do try to limit the amount that uh, I get on the buffer wheels. And it's just something you need to train your guys on being careful with. You know, for them to be aware of, okay, well, where might we have gotten some stain where we might not want it or where it might get on something else. So first I'm just gonna make a little pass to get back where I had walked. tie everything together. So then when we get to the end, you know, I can bring my towel right up to the edge, the walk off area. Usually on a job like this, again with other flooring and stuff out here, I'd probably have a little plastic work area to also work around so that I can step off the towel, I'm onto the plastic, I have a way to work out of the floor, I'm not worried about tracking stain where I don't want it. And then the last thing to do is where you last work out of the floor and you pick up your removal pad, just make sure that you wipe all that down. So now we're walking across the floor, I still like to work off cardboard because uh, I don't, want to get stain all over my knees. Uh, it helps protect even if I've got my shoes up here so I'm not leaving little toe drags in the floor. And then I like to use, again, just chip brush. I can get nice and tight. And again, you can see I've got an inch, inch and a half, right? That's all I've got to cut in. I don't have to spread stain all the way out into there, at least not yet, I don't want to. get my rag a little loaded up, see if I've got to get a little more stain in an area or not. If so, not a problem to dip, come on out, get some more stain in that area. To me, it's just easier to cut in this way. I'd rather come back, I can see right away if things match up, I'm not standing up with the buffer to try to gauge if I've matched my cut in with my field area. Get a nice big piece of cardboard that you can work around on. Work for six feet of area at a time. And again, I'm still watching the soft grain, so I feel I've got, you know, a little light area right here. So I can go back. I don't have to have too much stain, you know, in my brush to lightly put a little more just in that area because really the rag is doing the work on this, helping to blend it in, smooth those areas out, get rid of any uh, hard lines or hard stops that I've got or thin areas. I think maybe you also saw again why I like to use the chip brush and how that helps you get you know really tight up to the uh, baseboards without risking getting any up on the baseboards. 
even though we're putting cord around on this, I don't want to be sloppy, even if uh, on accident. So I like the chip brush, uh, especially when there's not cord around going up, but even when there is, I find this is an ideal tool to uh, do your cutting in with. As I look back over here, you know, I went, walked back into the wet stain. Um, I was using cardboard. I don't see any visible footprints, but just as a best practice, again, from contractors that we've talked to, some guys don't. I mean, I, really, I would not go back on this floor. Uh, I don't see any footprints left in it. But just in case, what I can do then is take my, uh, my removal piece of carpet. So it's the one that's least saturated, right? If it's really saturated, I may want to get a new piece of carpet even to make a final pass with that. But if I throw that back onto the floor, get it out there a little bit. You know, I can make just one more quick pass across the floor if I can get this centered. <laughs> just, just in case I left any footprints, it'll help do a final blend. Again, it's not a bad best practice to put in there just as a final safeguard. And you can be quick about it. All right, welcome everyone to our live Q&A uh, session. Um, I hope you all guys had a chance to uh, take a look at some of the uh, tips and tricks. And we've only showed two um, application methods. Of course, there's many application methods out there. So if you have a different application method you use besides rag on rag off, which is really common, uh, we just showed two here today. Uh, please, if you want to, you know, share a technique that you typically use, we'd love to hear from you as well as uh, take some time to uh, send your questions in so that we can answer those live. Right now, we're going to go to uh, an interview that we did with one of our BCC customers. And so we'll cut to that and we'll come back to the live Q&A. Hi, guys. It's Jessica Peterson with Custom Harbor Floors by Jeffries out of Midland, Michigan. Well, we love the dry fast stains. They're great. All the, the, the colors, there's so many colors and that's really great for us. And then the fact that we can be able to go and put the stain on and then two hours later, maybe, I mean, some are a little longer, you know, with the darker colors, but we can go back in and, you know, put a coat of sealer on and they can still be in their house that night. So we always try to like work out for the customers. If it's a dark color, I water pop it twice. Once after 100 and then once after 120. Especially on jobs like maple or hickory or like the job we're on now is Brazilian cherry. So we water popped it twice. And that they're going, I think, with special walnut. I do have a good job that we did with the dry fast and it was Jacobine. And we had done two of their houses already and turned out beautiful. Um, and they were one of my favorite customers ever too, twice. It was five inch quarter sawn white oak. We wire brushed it, water popped it, you know, did that whole process. Um, stained it with Jacobine, went back, did the rest of the process with the wire brushing and put the sealer on in tent seal and, <laughs> and finished with traffic. So and they were very happy. If you really get into it and take your time and do it the right way, it turns out really great. All righty, thanks Jessica. Again, we'd love to hear from you guys on any tips and tricks that you have or any type of techniques that you typically use. So. Uh, at this point, uh, please send in your questions. We'd love to uh, hear from you if you have any questions on anything you saw in our video or if there's uh, just something you'd like to share on uh, application tips and tricks. Um, also, I want to mention, of course, we're working on a nice wide open panel. I mean, we do have walls in one section, but, you know, when it comes to staining inside of a house, you definitely want to kind of, you know, have a game plan. You know, cut that ho house up into sections or that job site into sections and, um, you know, whatever works best for you. But yeah, we make it look a little easier on this wide open application, but you know, it's, it'll be the same way no matter what job site you're on. So 
our first question would be um, in regards to what technique you would use. It says, uh, might you use both the rag and the buffer technique, you know, at one time, or you prefer one over the other? So uh, when it comes to buffing on stain, if you are going to rag on smaller sections, then we would suggest that you want to emulate that same type of motion like uh, where you're burnishing the stain into the floor. Some guys will tend to be a little bit heavier with their rag on, rag off application. So if you're trying to um, introduce both techniques into one job site, then you could have uh, some heavier or darker areas versus lighter areas. So uh, yeah, definitely be careful, you know, when you're using two different techniques, burnish it in a little bit with the rag and really wipe it off really well. All righty, next question. I wasn't able to apply my sealer and finish for three days. Is there anything you would do to the stain before applying my sealer? Um, so if it's a water-based sealer, when you're saying if you let that sit for more than 48 hours, then you must abrade or buff your water-based seal coat. And uh, same with the stain. Our stain is an oil modified urethane stain, which means it has urethane resins in there. So therefore, if you are gonna be leaving that stain sitting more than 48 hours, it is recommended that you lightly abrade the stain. Now, you wouldn't want to do that with a buffer, no matter how many maroon pads you stack on top of one another. Uh, the best way to do it would be to cut out a maroon pad, put it on the bottom of a mop base, and just lightly rub the floor down. That'll give it enough scratch, <clears throat> excuse me, so that uh, you're able to, that it really helps that finish or that sealer uh, stick to that stain if it's been more than 48 hours. Ty, did you have anything you wanted to add there? I don't. <laughs> uh, other than, uh, I guess I do. Uh, you know, a lot of times we talk about actually doing that with the buffer. So I've done it uh, a number of times, actually stacking two maroon pads on top of each other. But I think the call out and the warning there is just, you got to really be able to float that buffer. You don't want to heal it at all. You really want to get down that floor quick. Um, but I think guys will find out and be impressed really with how durable dry fast stain is if you do have to put the buffer on it. But, you know, take some cautions, uh, try it in a small room first in case you have a problem with it. But uh, myself, I wouldn't hesitate to put two maroon pads on a buffer and buff that out if I needed to. Back to you, D. All right, thanks, Todd. Uh, next question, what color trends are you seeing slash pushing in your area? Well, because we're not doing floors, I really can't say. If it was me, I'd be pushing all natural. That way I can get in and get out. But in regards to color, you know, grays, I guess they still tend to be um, uh, requested, um, but, you know, I'm really not too sure because I'm not talking to a lot of contractors. I don't know, Todd, if you've heard any things in our particular area. Uh, I think if I, if I look at, you know, the color trends that are going out there that you see in uh, Hardwood Floors Magazine and Wood Floor Business, uh, it's still grays. It's still, you know, maybe some darker colors, um, some white washing, especially on wider planks. Um, so it just depends. I think it changes a little bit area to area. Uh, but I still think one of the best things guys can do out there is, you know, talk to your customers and, and look at, uh, you know, their lifestyle and uh, what kind of color might go well with, you know, their floor situation, what kind of flooring they have down, some of the other color trends and stuff they have in their house, and then make suggestions to them. If you're not good at that, uh, create a relationship with some interior designers out there who can kind of help you with the color trends and to match things up, um, it'd be a good kind of symbiotic relationship for you guys to have, uh, to be able to push things out to customers and get them excited about the possibilities of adding some different colors to their floor. And that's all I got. Good point, Todd. I was just joking about keeping it natural. This is a stain <laughs> webinar, so it's all about that color. So good question though. Our next question is, what is the advantage or disadvantage of using a sealer over the stain? So um, with our product, I think we make one mention where we really don't want a sealer used over the stain, and that's if you're using uh, Bona Natural, uh, Natural. And because with that product, we really want it to be as close to the wood as possible. That way it gives you that, um, what we call that heptic feel, that real natural feel. In regards to our other finishes, um, you know, using that sealer over stain is not necessary. Our stain is a sealer, so it's definitely gonna penetrate, give color, and seal the wood, so therefore you don't need to use a sealer. Uh, some guys would use a sealer if they're just looking for more build. Um, other than that, you know, 
it's just really preference. But we would say that using a sealer over stain when it's not necessary, um, it's just a step you don't have to take. But for more build or maybe to give more vibrancy, uh, vibrancy to some colors. I think Todd has something you'd like to add to that? Yep, uh, you just hit on it. So I think one of the most common products or sealers we see guys using over stain is Intense Seal. Um, even though the floor is sealed relatively well with the stain, you know, one of the, the properties behind Intent Seal is it reacts with some of the natural resins, um, colors, pigments, tannins and stuff in the wood to pull out some of those natural colors. So even with stain on the floor, it will do that a little bit and just pop that color a little more for you. So we see that quite a bit. Uh, we'd also caution don't use classic seal uh, on top of stain because uh, uh, it's really an acrylic base and it stays a little too soft. So we don't recommend using a, a natural or bonus seal, classic seal <laughs> over the top of stains, bonus seal for you guys who have really, really old product. Um, but that's it. The other caution, and sometimes guys have used dry fast sealer. And I would really caution against that just because you definitely have to go back and abrade that product. And I've just seen too many guys get in trouble going back and abrading that and then again putting a hip or something into it, taking sealer and stain all the way off the floor. And now you got a whole another issue. So if anything, stick to uh, intent seal um, and that would be it. Good points. Also, when it comes to, as you mentioned, dry fast seal or amber seal, you know, now you're adding more amber to that stain color. So you could be changing that color, which Todd may have said, I'm not sure. But hey, our next question is what tools slash methods do you use to keep the trim work clean during stain application? Well, one thing you want to be careful of is making sure that your trim is painted. And if it is, then you tend to have a better chance of just wiping the stain right off of that trim. Um, but some guys will tape the trim, you know, they'll tape all the trim work off. And again, being careful not to take uh, some of the, um, not to get too much stain up under the tape where it, it tends to bleed up on the trim as well. Um, but I, I would say that's probably the only thing I can think of. There's a, a rag on rag off method to where you can get real close to the trim work and um, with, without getting it up on there. And then the guy that's ragging off or wiping that excess stain off, then they'll make sure that they're, you know, have a cleaner rag and push it right up to the trim to try to keep that trim work off. Todd, do we have a sample over there? Where we, uh, I guess we show uh, the tape yeah. that's on the wall. Yeah, we got tape on the wall and then we showed a couple different methods during the applications. One is, again, where you use that rag and just make sure how to control that rag so you're not pushing the, the soaked part up against the, the trim but kind of rolling that over onto a clean part. Uh, and then I also showed on this floor back here um, how to use the uh, uh, chip brush. So I like those because they're really nice and thin. Uh, I like the, the two inch one because you can really stay nice and tight uh, with, with your work and with the baseboard and not get stuff up on it. Uh, and then if you have to, you can go all the way against it. But I think it's even more so like you pointed out in, in your videos on how to make sure you keep flipping that rag and keep a clean part of the rag so that when you're going back up, and wiping things off, you're not accidentally wiping stain up onto the baseboard. All right, good question. If you have a, a different method that you use for keeping that trim work uh, nice and clean, please uh, send that information in. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, next question is, what's your go-to final sanding prep for delivering a scratch-free surface before staining? So, you know, our recommendations is, uh, the, you know, the darker the stain, the finer you want to be when it comes to uh, your sanding procedures. We normally recommend taking the floor up to about a 120, uh, we say black, which is kind of a, a color sequence of our, 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 our uh, abrasive grits, but taking it up to a 120, maybe hard plating with a multi-disc. Um, but then, you know, a lot of guys are coming back, again, depending on color, to um, our diamonds. A diamond is a great way of really minimizing the scratch in that floor, running that on whether it be our multi-disc or even possibly the, uh, the power drive. So diamond abrasive, I would say probably maybe uh, 120 on the diamonds as well will deliver a nice fine scratch. So those are you know, some of the techniques that come to mind right offhand, but I'm gonna send it over to Todd for some additional info. Yeah, I think you actually covered it pretty well. <laughs> um, but I think if guys just think about again, what plate they're using and how big that disc is. So it wasn't too long ago when really the only option out there was still to use a 16 inch drive plate. 
and guys were going to screens or uh, maybe maroon pads, maybe maroon pads with some, some discs on them. Um, but then, you know, like when the power drive came out, now we've got four heads, uh, six inch product on there. So that's going to leave a finer scratch than even the, the 16 inch disc. Uh, and it spins a lot faster, but it also then tends to burnish the floor. So that's why we usually tend to move back down to a multi-disc. Now we're dealing with only a five inch disc. Uh, it's free spinning. Uh, they'll tend to cut each other's scratches up. And then the choice of sandpaper is also critical, like Dee said. So either black um, or moving all the way to uh, 80 or 120 grit diamonds will do the trick for you. All right, back to you, Dee. All righty. And just to kind of add a little bit more onto that, um, some guys will screen. I mean, screening can be a little bit aggressive. Most manufacturers would recommend or suggest screening prior to uh, applying a stain. A screen scratches the floor in a way to where it really opens up the wood to allow for a better stain penetration. But um, with some of the newer methods we just talked about, we're really not noticing a big difference in the color. So, all righty. Well, um, that concludes our Q&A session for today. Uh, please, uh, we have a new uh, podcast um, topic out. So uh, it's on the floor with Wayne and Rob. Please, uh, if you haven't had a chance to check out that podcast, uh, sign up for the, the Bona podcast on the floor with Wayne and Rob. I think you guys would be really impressed with uh, some of the interviews that they have and some of the material that they have to offer. Also, uh, if you're not part, if you haven't signed up for our e-learning courses, uh, I believe it was typed into the chat room how you can sign up for our e-learning e platform. Um, there you'll, you know, you can continue your education, watch some of the videos and learn um, more about the bonus system. So also, if you have any questions or issues, you can always uh, reach us at uh, ustech at bona.com or you can call us at 1-800-872-5515 and ask for the tech and training department. So that concludes our uh, Q&A session on staining. Please uh, look forward to uh, more webinars that we'll be doing monthly, and uh, we'll see you then. Thanks.